Good evening or good morning, good afternoon to everyone around the world. Good evening, everyone. I see everyone's connected, Claudia? Uh, I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Musha Neluheni, the curator of Dog Pound Days. And it's my pleasure to uh, welcome all of you and introduce our artist, Karabo Muki. Um, um, Karabo is Johannesburg-based uh, photographer, but he's currently in Sydney, so he's just woken up. So thank you for joining us on your morning. Thank you. Um, so I think, Claudia, there are some people that you'd like Karabo to meet before we get more into uh, I think works. I think we'll do that at the end. So if at you, I think we'll start off with uh, Karabo and you having a conversation about uh, the exhibition and then a little bit about his practice and then... Uh, you know, once people join, I'm sure people are always late as well. So we'll do a QA and a at the end and also some some chatting and some introductions. I um, also want to acknowledge that in, in asking an Indigenous African to interview another Indigenous African, we maybe uh, uh, didn't um, uh, underscore the importance of a land acknowledgement within a Canadian context. So I just want to say as we wrap up that we are in a country and in a city that is on Indigenous land um, and that we are uh, privileged to be able to do the work that we do as a Black cultural organization and we recognize that this is land that historically belongs to um, the Haudenosaunee Mississaugas of the Credit, the uh, mm -hmm. Chippewa, Huron, Wendat, and um, Métis peoples. Toronto is a super diverse city. You'll see that when you get here, Carabo. And so there's a lot of times as you walk around, you don't necessarily know where people hail from, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is there's beauty in that, but it also just reminds you to never take for granted what it means to be Indigenous. And for us as Black folks who are dealing with the histories of forced migrations for those of us who are descendants of uh, those of us who were brought to the Americas um, uh, in, in parts of history when we were forced to leave the continent. And then folks like you, Musha, Kwesi, who are indigenous Africans who were born and raised on the continent, but are out in the diaspora in some way. Uh, for us, it's even more important that we're allies and support of the Indigenous peoples of these lands in their fight for human rights and social justice. So we always say to people, think about, you know, where you donate your time, where you give your money, where what you can do to help. I know, Karabo, you're in Sydney, and we know the story of Indigenous uh, the Aboriginal people there is also an important one. So wherever mm -hmm. you're all on this call and whatever you can do to help uh, the Indigenous communities that you may be adjacent to or connected to. Okay, Karabo. So let's go back to the beginning. So you were uh, actually um, studying to be a graphic designer. So can you tell us all how you fell into art, why photography, and what took you away from the design world? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, in 2007, I enrolled into a uh, art school. Um, but I found that the, the curriculum just wasn't necessarily designed for me and the way that I saw the world. Um, and I found it was very difficult for me to express myself creatively um, within the realms of graphic design. But a lot of my imagery really lends on, uh, or a lot of my design really lends on my imagery and the way that I perceive the world. Um, and, you know, even in my formative years growing up, I had always had a an attraction to uh, visual aids or visual media, uh, whether it was watching like a shit ton of movies or reading through a lot of magazines. You know, my family would have a lot of drum magazines or National Geographic magazines and um, um, the the narrative of using uh, photographs to tell stories has really intrigued me. Um, and I think that always resonated with me in the way that I was able to absorb a lot and interact with people in the world and communities, you know. Um, and when I went into studying graphic design, I, I quickly learned that photography was more of my uh, outlet and it gave me a voice as well as a way to connect with people, connect with communities, connect with uh, the things that I love, you know. Uh, I. I think I also started to believe that I 
I'm more of a uh, visual anthropologist um, uh, than a documentarian per se. Um, but yeah, that's that's generally how I got into uh, photography through um, learning that I did not like advertising. Uh, I wasn't attracted to the idea of manipulating people into, um, you know, getting these sales for products that I don't believe people need. Whereas uh, photography, for me personally, I feel like a vessel for people's voices. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to learn things beyond what I had already thought I knew or had experienced. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to deepen my knowledge about uh, certain aspects, uh, social, political aspects that I felt or still feel are very important to me um, in my in my journey uh, as an artist, as a visual anthropologist, as a photographer. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I think just for the context of our uh, Canadian uh, audience, uh, if you could just give a background uh, about drum magazines and the importance of the history of drum magazines in South Africa. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, during the apartheid era, um, there definitely wasn't a lot of um, media that was accessible to uh, Black people, uh, people of color, uh, especially the uh, publications that highlighted our stories, you know, uplifted our stories and placed a, a spotlight on on Black stories. Um, so having proximity to these uh, magazines uh, allowed me to 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 access a world that I didn't think was accessible uh, through media. Um, a lot of the media that was broadcast was generally uh, white media, um, kind of creating a narrative of how uh, families should grow up in the apartheid era and 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 afterwards. You know, uh, I think there was a heavy presence of uh, how to have like a white uh, colonialized family. Um, and being able to see like my own people in in publications uh, made me realize like oh no you don't have to follow the step by step program that you are indoctrinated with through media. Um, so having access to these magazines was very important in my my understanding of the world, especially as a young black man and growing up in South Africa. You know I think. Through my experience uh, and my personal experience, um, a lot of Black families were doing their utmost to provide more for their children um, in conditions that weren't necessarily uh, accepting of that. And, uh, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to have a family that was determined to put us through good education and good schooling. But that meant that you were almost removed from your community and put into predominantly white spaces. And uh, you are then met with a lot of conflict growing up uh, uh, as to like where your space is in the world. But um, I think my parents always tried to remind me through whatever they could, you know, um, like I was saying, these magazines was just one small fraction of that reminder of my culture and who who I am and where I'm from. Thank you. <clears throat> and also um, to that point that you made, you and I've spoken a lot about this, um, oh. that both of us were born in Soweto and both of our parents moved um, us to the suburbs once they were allowed to. Um, <clears throat> that dichotomy is something that both you and I have spoken about and dealing with where you at school with these uh, white kids and you're not white enough for that but then you go home to your grandmother or whatever and so on and then you're not black enough for that community because yeah. now you're um, a coconut they say mm. as they call it in South Africa you know black on the outside what you know white inside so can you speak a little bit about that because I think that's a shared experience that you and I both have that many people may not really know about yeah totally um you know I I was like I was saying, I was fortunate enough to have hardworking parents that uh, wanted to provide the best for their children, and uh, a, a milestone or a key ingredient for that was just providing good education. Um, education would then give you access to um, worlds that weren't necessarily accessible um, for, uh, from our parents' perspective, uh, because we would then be 
uh, in alignment with uh, like our competitors, you know, the white community. Um, and I think like it was a bit jarring for me growing up, uh, having an experience of going to public school and being around predominantly black areas. Um, you know, I was born in Soweto um, and I eventually moved from Soweto at a very young age to uh, the suburbs where life seemed to, you know, um, it seemed very different in the sense that there was very little community uh, that I was able to experience within the suburban areas. Um, uh, there was a lot less freedom that I was able to experience in um, suburban areas. Um, and I think my world seemed to feel like it was shrinking. I didn't have the possibility or the opportunity to explore as much as I could when I was living in the township, you know. Uh, living in a township, there's a, a larger sense of community. There's a larger sense of um, care from people in the community. Um, and there's just a togetherness that I can't necessarily describe. I mean, in the townships, you'll find a lot of houses don't have walls on the outside of their homes, or if they do, they're very small. Whereas in suburban areas, they're very gated, high walls, electric fencing, um, it's almost as if people are trying to keep people uh, from uh, penetrating their, their, their little worlds that they create. Um, and I, you know, growing up, I, I kind of had to find my fitting in the world, um, but I always had a sense of uh, pride in my identity, trying to um, own what I was interested in and and allow that to uh, help me navigate the world that I was growing up in. And, you know, I had a lot of white friends who were listening to hip hop. And at a particular time in my life, I started to listen to a lot of uh, punk and rock. And, you know, I'd be scrutinized by these white kids saying, like, why would you listen to this white music when you're black? Um, and the same thing, or oh, the opposite would happen in black neighborhoods where I was sharing my experience of like, indulging in these quote unquote white activities. Um, and yeah, I think if anything, it, it was difficult growing up in these worlds that weren't necessarily accepting of you because you had different interests. Um, and you are, you're almost being, I don't wanna say prosecuted, but you're on, on, on trial because of your skin color, you know? Um, but I refuse to let that limit my, my uh, my, my way of navigating the world, my uh, way of interacting with the world and uh, just experiencing things that led me on to past like photography and skateboarding. You know, I, I grew up in, in loving skateboarding too, which was, it's typically back in my day, at least, uh, not a lot of black kids were doing it. Um, I could come into proximity with, um, or I could count on one hand, how many black kids were actually skateboarding in Johannesburg. Um, but fuck it, let me down such incredible journeys, uh, such incredible tunnels where I met such beautiful people. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's, I think that's um, a, a, the important thing leading to the work is community. Um, because as you said, like the community in Soweto is very, very different from a suburban community. Um, and your works, uh, especially in Dogpound days, uh, celebrates that sense of community and also celebrates bringing white kids into this predominantly black community. So let's speak a little bit about the Dog Pound and how this all came together and this exhibition. Sure. Um, yeah, just being involved in skateboarding at a time where you know, skateboarding wasn't like, very accessible or loved by uh, Black communities. Um, we didn't have the knowledge of where to uh, access these these tools to skateboard or even the media side of things. And I came into it at a pretty, pretty late age. I want to say I was like 17, 18. Um, and my interactions with people were very organic. You know, you start to discover where people go and skate outside of these uh, safe spaces like the skate parks um, and this, uh, this search for like uh, wanting to fill up my, my curiosity 
um, just led me down to uh, the cent central business district of uh, Johannesburg, CBD, uh, which typically was a playground for a lot of uh, skateboarders on Sundays when the, the city was empty. And at, at our sort of uh, training ground or our meeting spots in the central uh, business district, it's called the uh, Library Gardens, is where I met a lot of um, skateboarders from different parts of the city, from the township of Soweto, um, from the suburbs. Um, it was just a, a huge mesh up of just strange and wonderful human beings that wanted to get together. Um, but by and large, a lot of people were still afraid of going to areas like uh, Soweto or taking public transport isn't necessarily the um, easiest thing to do in South Africa. And it's not the most desirable form of transportation. Um, so you'll find like a lot of black people grow up with taking these uh, informal uh, systems of uh, transportation and uh, getting around the city, getting around uh, uh, Johannesburg. Um, but a lot of white kids are still afraid to take taxis, which are, they're like minibuses um, that uh, transport 18 to 20 people, typically over the limit. Um, and they can be very dangerous. Uh, but uh, once you're in these neighborhoods, it's you're 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 welcome. You're embraced uh, with uh, warm hospitality. Um, but yeah, I I met some dudes out skating, and I think a lot of the the relationship developed organically because we realized like okay, we're we're in this together. We're a handful of black kids that are out here trying to enjoy the sport, make it work for us, um, and. Through our like dotted uh, interactions with one another across the city, I organically formed a relationship with dudes who were just doing exactly what I gravitated towards, you know, um, and that was creating something for themselves, uh, doing something uh, that they loved, which was making music, creating a punk and skate scene that was too afraid to go to the township. Um, they realized if they wanted if they wanted their own sort of coverage or to create something for themselves, it, it was all in their hands. And there was no use in relying on what was uh, just white media, you know, like dudes that were just white photographers, white dudes running publications. Um, you know, a lot of the sponsors or the big brands are, are people that don't resonate with their culture. Um, and uh, I, I highly respected what they were doing. Uh, this uh, do-it-yourself ethic was just so beautiful to me. Um, and I then, you know, after having an interaction with them, seeing them perform live for the first time, uh, seeing the band TCIYF, who I documented, perform for the first time, I realized there's something really, really fucking beautiful within this community um, and seeing how they're able to uh, cultivate something for their own um, and welcome in whoever, you know, shut them out previously, um, which I thought was very, very beautiful. Um, that just led me up, uh, onto a path of wanting to document uh, this band. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know why I was waking up every morning uh, wanting to go to Soweto because I live in the eastern, uh, eastern side of Johannesburg. Uh, so it's quite a distance to go to the south. Uh, but there was something that that really uh, triggered me that that made me fall in love with uh, the ethics of this community and uh, just everything that they were doing uh, for their community. Okay, cool. And then in terms of uh, that community as well, this you know the the skating community in Johannesburg, uh, especially since there are very few uh, formal skate parks, um, that do it you know do-it-yourself DIY aspect of it is quite important in your work. Um, and you chose as well to uh, not shoot digitally, but to shoot on film. Can you like just discuss that process and why you prefer it, um, as well as why the series is in black and white as opposed to color? Yeah, sure. Um, I think like just to start off with the, the black and white and color uh, question is just that, I have always felt that black and white imagery has 
had a long lasting impression on my memory um, and it shifts emotions for me. Um, there's there's a lot more depth and layer in uh, black and white storytelling. You know, when I when I think back to my experiences of looking through history books or through drum magazines, um, all the imagery I was um, absorbing was black and white. And I think there's just like, it creates a texture of history for me. You know, um, there's a lot more to look for within the picture. You're not uh, visually um, struck by oversaturated colors or just too much to look at. You know, there's, there's a calmness that, that uh, I feel resonates with myself and black and white when I look at uh, black and white images. And I just felt this might be a good uh, story for me to tell uh, through black and white imagery. And uh, Peter Mogovane, who is a uh, photographer who documented a lot of the apartheid era, is, his work is all black and white and that he's had a huge impression on me as a upcoming photographer in this world um yeah and um sorry could you repeat the question <laughs> no no also as to why uh you you uh, uh you don't shoot digital oh okay yeah i mean i i do shoot both um but when it comes to my discovery of film i was working in retail and uh I, there was a camera that was uh, in this retail store for a while, and I just decided this camera needs to be put in use. It was a K, Pentax K1000, and um, I shot my very first film image on this camera, and uh, this, I actually thought I'd loaded in uh, color film into the camera, um, so this was a a perfect little mistake that I made, um, you know. I had shot this photograph of a friend of mine who had implored me to shoot photographs of uh, my community, especially the skateboarding community that I was involved with. Uh, this friend of mine who um, you may have seen in the uh, picture, um, he's a skateboarder, um, a very talented skateboarder who just felt that his story wasn't being told in a way that, or conveyed in a way that uh, really told his story. Um, he, you know, he told me straight up, "I'm tired of these white photographers shooting, uh, shooting me. Come, come out and shoot me." Um, and this was one of the first photographs I shot of him, uh, just getting away from security um, in a spot that's very difficult to skate. But yeah, uh, I just found that shooting on film, it 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 felt like there was more intention in the moments that I was uh, capturing. Um, I I realized that my the the number the number of uh, images I could capture were quite limited too. Um, so it told me how to be patient. It told me how to uh, really like really delve into the moment, really participate uh, and and be present. Um, and yeah, it just it's also showed me that like there are there's so much beauty in in uh, mistakes that one uh, one can perceive that they're making, especially myself, you know, I'm very critical of my own work and uh, what I put out there. Um, but it's also taught me like not to chase uh, perfectionism. Um, and there are, there's this, there's an undeniable magic that you can capture, uh, that, that that's embodied in um, capturing images with film. Um, so that's really like what, attracted me to wanting to shoot in film. Um, but, you know, to this day, I, I do find myself still having to shoot digitally. Um, yeah, just for commercial reasons mostly, but film is definitely where my heart is at, you know? Great, that's great. Um, so I think Claudia has a um, do you want to do your introductions um, now? Um, there's also just like a couple of things that maybe uh, Krabo can talk about first, um, including like some of your other projects. Um, cool. Like maybe talk about a bit about Greetings from Johannesburg and Island Gals. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. I mean, um, 
just to just to reiterate like what I've been saying, a lot of my work is um it spotlights like underrepresented faces um and, and communities that are close to me. Um, whether it be uh friends that I have within my circle of friends or um just wanting to understand um uh, where like where my community is going or understand new communities and i i embarked on a project uh which was a, a documentary project um on skateboarding in johannesburg and the um the culture of it as well as communities involved um which was really fun i mean i got i got to work with such incredible people from all parts of johannesburg uh, just showcasing their contribution to the culture as well as uh, the importance of of these community communities and uh, the culture. Um, so yeah, I had I had a wonderful time um, working with an incredible production team as well. Um, just getting to know these pockets of um, different skateboarders uh, that are all over Johannesburg uh, in their in their little crews um that all you know contribute largely to why skateboarding is so popular especially amongst young black kids um in today's era you know it's 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 such a beautiful thing to be to be able to bear witness to it and to to be able to document it um and share the the, the exponential growth of these uh communities and and the love that everybody has to share you know like i i pour in a lot of love into my work and um, I can see that the love is there within uh, the people that I work with. Um, you know, these are images over here. You'll see some uh, images of uh, girls and uh, black girls in skateboarding that I uh, embarked on, uh, which is a photo documentary project, an ongoing series, you know, and a lot of the time the work seems to stem from just South Africa. Um, but I've also noticed through my travels and my experiences that it's really like a pan-African project, you know, it, it, it's, it's global. And um, I just feel a responsibility to uh, celebrate um, my communities and uh, culture. And uh, yeah, just, just, uh, just allow our black story to be told in a way that is very uplifting uh, and truthful, you know. Um, I feel like you kind of talked about this a little bit, but um, you've been taking photographs of of the skate scene for like quite a while now. Um, I won't age you, but I was surprised by your age. I'll, I'll say that. Um, yeah, yeah. And I just, uh, I there's um, if people haven't had a chance to see it, greetings from Johannesburg. It, you can watch it on on YouTube, um, and I feel like it kind of showed some of. The way that you um, approach uh, portrait photography specifically, I think, and I think we kind of talked about the difference between like the photographs that you've taken of um, TCYIF um, as opposed to the other ones you've taken of like uh, the skate scene and kind of the relationships you build there. So, I, if you could talk a little bit about um, how that kind of has developed, um, also your series. Uh, love act which we didn't um, show any photos from but mm. also quite an intimate uh, series as well yeah sure um I guess what's really important for me as a as a photographer and visual anthropologist uh, documentarian whatever you want to call it I think it's uh what's really important for me is uh, developing relationships um before I engage in any sort of photographic work, you know, uh, building a, a foundation of trust, um, understanding, uh, creating a dialogue between me and uh, the people, the stories that I am working on um, or the people that I'm working with. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I try to avoid the term subjects because um, again, I am just a vessel for people's stories. Um, stories that I'm attracted to that I find that I feel the world um, might may be able to resonate with uh, or maybe interested in and uh, uh, I do find that 
uh, with with every project that I uh, embark on, um, being able to build some sense of proximity um, and um, just mutual understanding so that there's respect and trust involved in the process uh, is very, very important to me. Um, so yeah, when I go about these projects, you know, like with the with the punk and skateboarding, it was very organic because I was very much involved in that uh, community. Um, but when it comes to my um, proximity to documenting the story of black women in skateboarding, you know, it's, uh, it's it's not necessarily my story to share as a black male who probably do doesn't experience the hardships that a lot of black women uh, experience worldwide, but being able to uh, approach it, approach the uh, the story and the relationship with, uh, you know, positive and uh, positive intent, um, I think that allows for for both of us to to feel like okay, there's something that we can build on together and. Uh, a narrative that we can share with the world that is actually accurate to uh, people's stories. You know, I am. I never embark on a story in 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 the ways that a lot of journalists or, um, I guess, the way that the world tries to commodify everything. You know, I um, I try to uh, understand that people are. They're priceless and their stories are priceless. Um, and yeah, a lot of it is all just love projects. You know, I, I never I never knew that documenting a punk band in 2014 would land me in a position where I am sharing the story with um people around the world, you know. Um so yeah, it's just just really coming into any project with uh, the intention of building trust. Um Speaking of like the the reach, I mean, now that you're in in Canada, at least your work is in Canada. Um, I think we kind of talked a little bit about perceptions of of punk, um, and I think in one of our conversations, you kind of brought up uh, devil worship and those types of associations. Um, mm. But I think since since 2014, and since kind of your um, like involvement in the scene I'm wondering like if you've seen a change in like that perception or I think you also talked a lot about the community that um has been made uh yeah. and like a lot of the photos in include like kids and um you know all sorts of people yeah I mean I I would hate to take the credit for that I was <laughs> merely just uh a participant in all of it and I was lucky enough to be welcomed into these spaces to document the development of the 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 culture and the community um yeah I mean I I was able to bear witness like firsthand uh how these groups of people who wanted to introduce a different lifestyle into their community and that being wanting to do something that is beyond what is expected of you if you do grow up in the township, you know. Um, uh, seeing these young men and young women participate or grow something that, um, you know, something that, that would be typically deemed as taboo within the township or um, if you typically gravitate towards rock and roll music or punk rock music growing up in an African household, um, you are deemed to be like a, a devil worshiper um, and none of this evil can exist within, you know, your home or near your grandmother. This is not how your family would raise you being black. But um, I was able to see like through this DIY um, ethic and just the um, the resilience that a lot of the people in these punk and skate communities in the township had, um, um, a lot of it was embraced by people who had very little understanding of what they were trying to cultivate at the time. And um, I've I've seen firsthand like uh, parents go from 
or family members go from, I can't understand this, or why are you participating in this white activity to, well, now I see you bringing in these white kids into spaces that they typically would have been scared of. And uh, now they're learning something about black culture uh, and they're having a good time. They can see it's safe around these spaces. Um, and, and seeing how they responded to how immediate things were changing around their environment, um, I, I guess they were able to have their own lived experience of, oh, wow, like all these mis misconceptions that I had about um, this this world uh, that uh, these young people are cultivating within the township is just kind of shattered. Um, and there's more of a cross-pollination and a bridging of communities. Um, so yeah, I, I got to say, man, like it's been really fucking awesome seeing how um, the guys in in Soweto have been able to um, really shift the narrative of like being left outside on the fringes because you're from the township to being the almost the epicenter of culture uh, within these communities. Um, my the last thing I kind of wanted to say, and then I swear I'll move to introductions. Um, it's not like quite a question, but I think like something you talked about um, and was like traveling um, and the two things that you would bring would be your skateboard and, and your camera. And you kind of brought those up as like an international language of, of skateboarding and photography, um, which I think is really interesting, both because you kind of brought up uh, skateboarding and photography. Last time you talked about it, you were saying it's like I think there's a lot of problem solving involved in those of like seeing something kind of in your mind's eye, particularly like if there is an escape park of like how, what type of tricks are you going to do across like this cityscape, but also in terms of, um, of style. Um, and you, you kind of said that like, if you, if you're skateboarding and you don't have a style, then you're just, you just won't be good. Um, you said it better than that, but. Um, I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about the travel that you've done, I think particularly to maybe Norway um, and kind of what your experience was uh, connecting with people with photography and, and with skate skating. Yeah, sure. Um, I, uh, I think I caught like the travel bug pretty, pretty late or um, at a unique time in my life where my older sister had moved to Norway and um, uh going out there to visit her i immediately felt fell in love with um uh, how vastly different everything was from uh, my african experience to this nordic experience um and i then decided like okay cool like i definitely want to try spend a little bit more time out here um get to know the people the culture uh and see what that has to offer and um I think it's quite unique in this, oh, skateboarding is quite unique in this way that um, it is a sport and a tool that connects people. Um, it is, there's something so immediate about the bond uh, that skateboarders can have, especially when you come from different parts of the world. Um, you don't necessarily have to speak the same language. It's, I've often equated it to mathem mathematics in a sense, you know, it's just a very universal language. Um, and if you partake in the sport and the culture, you know the ins and outs of it, the history behind it. Um, and it's just a, it's an easy way to develop uh, relationships. Um, and when I moved to Norway, I, um, I found that I was able to uh, find a footing within a community fairly quickly uh, just through skateboarding. And, uh, you know, having this, my tool, my, uh, my camera as a, as a friend and a tool uh, partner and a lover, um, it was something that allowed me to um, kind of hide my curiosity of spaces that I've uh, been in, you know, um, on days where I felt like, oh, I can't necessarily go and meet up with people to go skate. It's been something that's carried me through uh, my days where I, I feel the need to want to um, discover more. Um, so having these two things go hand in hand has just always been uh, a helpful tool for me when I've 
embarked on my solo journeys. You know, I've never traveled with anybody. Um, so a lot of the places that I've been in have been very far in spaces where I don't know anyone, but having a camera and a skateboard has helped me uh, connect with people immediately, um, which is nice. You know, even now being in Sydney, I'm um, finding my footing over here and I'm, I'm meeting people, which is very nice uh, solely because of these two tools that I have. Um, and yeah. I'm 34 you... years old, just to <laughs> age myself, and I'm still skating. <laughs> have you been back to the skate park, and uh, have you taken photographs of anyone? Uh, yeah, I actually just went skating a day and a half ago. Um, uh, my body is broken. Um, but no, I've actually been, I've, I've been very relaxed on shooting photos. Um, like I said, I'm just really trying to get to know people within uh, communities over here before I uh, engage in being um, invasive with the the camera, you know, um, like I said, it's just very important for me to create these relationships and um, start to understand uh, these pockets of communities within uh, the spaces that I'm entering. Um, okay, being uh, aware of the time. Um, as some of you may probably know, uh, we weren't able to bring Karabo here for the show run. Um, so we wanted to introduce him to a couple of people from the community. So I'm going to ask people to turn their cameras on if they feel comfortable and maybe ask uh, Courtney to hop on first and hey so Do many some introductions um and... i do want to say hi to everybody and thanks for taking the time out to uh, join me on this talk um thanks to those who were able to visit the show and big thanks to everyone who shared the uh the uh festival the talk and and, and everything uh, with your friends and family This is my first time doing this, so uh, if you do have any questions. Uh... So just to, I was hoping that people could also introduce themselves, um, and then if you have questions or comments, also to share that now is a good time, but maybe uh, maybe you can start with Courtney, and then maybe Quasi could introduce himself as well. Are you okay? It can, like, can microphone, microphone. Does it work now? He's, okay. there, yeah. There we go. Thanks, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> um, good evening. It's evening here in Toronto, Karabu. Um, and I was wondering, have you, you know, what, 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 what chance have you had to see <laughs> the show that's on the other side of the world? So in terms of seeing the, how your images have been uh, curated and presented in the space. Um, Claudia, Musha, how, how have you shared that with, with Caribou? Well, first, this is Courtney McFarland. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I'm Courtney McFarland, um, a visual artist and curator here in Toronto. And I had a privilege of curating the last contact show um, with band, uh, I think it was last year. Um, with uh, another African um, born photographer uh, who's online now, Kwesi, um, from Ghana, uh, who also filmed uh, in black and white and, and uh, has strong connections to um, some of the, the folks in his images. Um, yeah, so similarly, and have very sort of strong filmic qualities to the work that was on exhibit. But I'm wondering, you know, what do you, what, what are your thoughts about the way the show was put together, the images selected? Did you have a role in 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 collaborating and, and deciding about the images chosen and the positioning? Um, it's a process question more than anything else. Right. Um, just from my experience, I had been working with an incredible team um, from band um, and. You know, Musha, Claudia, uh, Karen, everybody that was very hands-on and involved um, 
I think the realization that my physical presence might be a bit of a challenge, mm -hmm. um, but there was never, I never felt like I was going to be led astray or that I was uh, un uh, left to be uninvolved in the, uh, the curation, uh, especially the process of it. Um, I, I do feel like there was a lot of trust involved. Um, the uh, the ladies installed a lot of trust in in uh, the images that I wanted to present. Um, they also implored me to uh, include more that they thought would uh, help strengthen um, the narration of the storytelling uh, and its curation. Um, the write ups that we did were absolutely phenomenal. I mean, uh, we would draft uh, different write ups between uh, ourselves uh, to get to a cohesive uh, little bio for uh, the introduction of this of the uh, work um, and the exhibition. Um, and yeah, I think when it came to the layout, I installed 100% trust in uh, their expertise and uh, their their uh, foresight in, in uh, conveying the story that would have been uh, truthful to how um, how I documented uh, this experience, and uh, yeah, I'm to be honest, I'm just blown away by the work that they've done. They great. they they really killed it. That they did. It's a great show, and it sounds like a really collaborative uh, process. So thank mm. you for sharing that. Yeah, I have them to thank for for all the heavy lifting. To be honest. I, I'm just gonna jump in and so everyone is in Courtney and say if everyone introduces themselves, then you do questions because that way he'll know everybody. Don't don't be the unruly Jamaican uh, Courtney. Because <laughs> <laughs> we wanna make sure you know who's on the call, Carabo, and then we'll do a free for all. Like people can jump in and out, but if we do a round of intros, I think you'll get a sense of the community that's on. Uh, Claudia is kinder than I am, I can call it <laughs> Courtney. I mean, I kind of set it up like that. So that's on me, Courtney. Uh, so maybe like Quasi, Josephine, Craig, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Hello, Carabo. So really, really, I'm really honored to hear you speak after seeing your amazing work up at um, the gallery. Um, yeah, so my name is Quasi, Quasi Che. I'm also a visual artist, photographer, and um, I double in social media <laughs> management as well sometimes. But yeah, I'm, I'm a creative at heart and um, by practice. And um, just, I guess, a few things that I picked from your story and that I could relate to. Growing up in high school, I was like the only one who kind of listened to rock music. Lenny Kravitz was like, I was a number one fan. So I know what it's like to navigate in spaces like that. So seeing this, it was very, for me, I felt like I was seeing like um, pieces from a documentary. The mm. timeline was really well put and that for me made the experience very, very amazing. So again, it's an honor and I look forward to seeing more of your amazing work and pleased to meet you. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much. My I, uh, pleasure. I'm really glad the uh, work resonated with you. So uh, thanks for taking the time and yeah, hopefully you'll be seeing a lot more from me. I look forward to it. Same here. Hi, my name is Josephine. I am a writer and a curator. I'm currently in Montreal, but I do the back and forth. So I haven't seen the show yet, um, but your work to me is extremely nuanced and powerful and the vulnerability and relationships that come out of it are so important right now when I feel like the conversations around um, Black image is extremely performative and sometimes too general. Your work really commends a sort of care and specificity. And the way you talk about it is so fearless. Like I can see the the way that you present yourself and your presence in itself is also just really wonderful to be around. So I'm very glad to meet you and I can't wait to see the exhibition when I come to Toronto. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> bringing it here to my eye. Um, I really, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, and 
hopefully we can connect further you know um yes just i would hope yeah for sure and that goes for anybody if anybody wants to reach out to me uh please do not hesitate i would love to make time for all of your questions or even if you have ideas you want to share with me conversations i'm i'm open Hi, Bravo. Hi, Karen. Hi, Bravo. Uh, my name is Craig Darville. I, um, with Stephen Bulger, who is a prominent Canadian photography dealer, uh, together we have a an online photography platform called Photo.com. That's F F O T O, and it's sort of uh, an incubator for Bulger Gallery and other uh, dealers in North America who specialize in photography. And we're increasingly taking on. Um, uh, non-represented but credible artists who uh, exhibit in museums, uh, group shows and that sort of thing. Um, and I was really happy that Claudia invited me to be part of this. Your work is exciting to me because there is a direct lineage to, to punk rock photography going right back to American, specifically skate culture in the 80s. That is a delight to see. Your work in black and white to me lends an ageless quality to it. It's really hard to pinpoint when those images are being made. Uh, mm -hmm. It's gratifying to somebody in their mid fifties who was reading magazines that had features about this when uh, we were younger and more able to do those sorts of things to see that that spirit still lives on. And the way you speak about it is consistent with the way it was spoken about 35 years ago. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's really, um, you're onto it. It's good. It's honest. It's real work. It's good photography. Uh, and I would like to see more of it. Thank you very much, Craig. I really appreciate that. And uh, you can bet you'll definitely be seeing a lot more. Great. Is anybody else? Kevin going to talk? Yeah. You know me. I like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel like my bio isn't as cool as everyone else, uh, but you all are doing amazing things. Uh, Kwesi, just as a side note, uh, I love your work as well. I saw a lot of that, so it was really amazing and nice to, to see you. Um, my name's Kevin. I like to surround myself with cool people, and that's why I'm hanging out here tonight. Um, I am a, a, a principal of a middle school of 700 kids, and we're, we also have a regional arts program. So. You know, I find myself uh, trying to to be inspired to to draw that inspiration back into our schools and communities, and um, I feel like band is always uh, like my number one spot for that. So, uh, thank you always, as Claudia and Karen and Musha for for this great show. The the one thing I, I think that um, I really loved about your work was almost how the photos brought in other senses. There's that one photo that is stuck. Well, there's, there's two photos and I'm here on behalf of my family as well. My daughter's in the background and, and uh, loved your work as well. And my wife uh, is on the other side here. So hello yeah. to everyone. Um, there was two photos really stuck out. My daughter's favorite one was that one with, I think the three or four boys looking into, um, into almost through like a tarped a tented area. And it was yeah. almost like, um, a children's book where anything could be behind there. there. There was like a whole narrative that was created behind that screen of what could be there. And, and we spent so much time there. And I think that one would really resonated, but the one that for me personally, that I, I think I, we saw the show maybe what, two weeks ago, two weeks ago. And, and I've carried with me since there's, the, it almost looks like a party scene. I don't know the name, the, the, the title of it, but it's like a, it's got a bunch of people, um, um kind of in it and it's a it's a very full photo but it's almost like you can smell what it would smell like there it's almost like you could hear the music and the, and the chatter it's almost like it created a movie through a still photo right. and i love that and i don't know if do you know which picture i'm talking about um I is the website the there, there was, i, I know, the will website. try to pull it up i think i know is it the scene where someone seems to be chopping up a little bit of weed in the uh, foreground? Yes. Yeah. That's the party scene. I think so. And, and that's it. And, it, and it's, there's. You could definitely smell that. Um... <laughs> that's, that's the one. And, and, and... yes, it, it, but like, so many other things. Like, it's almost like there's a soundtrack. There's a smell. Mm -hmm. There's like the, almost like you can hear like the dialogue of the people. I guess my question was, like when you're taking a photo like that, do, are you looking to cap? Yes, that's the one. 
Um, like it, yeah. it's a it's a movie in a still shot, which which I think is is really amazing. And like even when I'm looking at this now, like it, it's almost like um, you, you can hear you know you know like when you're in a crowd and you can't make out all the talk, but you know everyone's talking. It's almost yeah, like right. that soundtrack that photo when you're taking a photo like that um is that something that you're consciously aware of are you looking at capturing that moment and those things come out afterwards or are, as a photographer are you looking to say i am trying to capture everything that i am in this moment as well so i'd love to hear your thoughts on that yeah um thank you for the uh incredible compliment um you know it's it's always a dream of mine to hear that people feel the intimacy um in the images that i'm sharing with them and if it can heighten your senses uh, senses that typically wouldn't be triggered by looking at uh, images that's that's even more profound um but as a you know i grew up on a lot of film watching um when my parents were away at work um the television was essentially my babysitter and i think it's stimulated a lot of like image or image taking in my mind and the way that I um, uh, perceive the world, uh, especially in moments where I find that I can be quite a introverted extrovert. Um, but when I want to pull inward, I am fascinated by what is uh, developing right in front of my eyes. You know, um, I, I've always tried to look at or understand that all these fleeting moments are moments of history you know um even looking back on the photographs that i've shot sometimes i've gone through the archives for uh, this particular exhibition and and seen works that i overlooked uh for so many years and gone like damn this was it might have been an innocent moment that i've been capturing at the time but um there's something very like long-lasting and historic about uh, these innocent fleeting moments. And uh, uh, in an image like that, uh, the quote unquote party scene, it's just really being able to capture um, a part of uh, the connectivity that I see within people, within uh, culture, within these moments that, you know, are, I mean, that was just before the, um, the actual, the gig that they were throwing at the uh, dog pound, which was the house that uh, the band stayed at and where they threw a lot of the the, the gigs that they would have um, within the township. Um, so just being able to capture the anticipation of um, what the day was going to unfold uh, is also very important to me and learning that it's not about capturing singular moments that would stand out as here's the band pay, playing, you know, there's there's community behind the band. Um, and who are these people that are gravitating towards this world? Um, so if I can have interactions and proximity toward everybody that makes the scene what it is, then, you know, um, I feel that I am doing justice to the story um, rather than giving a very like, one-dimensional perception on what is happening within uh, this community um so yeah i it's it's hard to say for me like i do find sometimes i shoot photos and then realize like oh shit i didn't even see that little magical moment happening in the corner over there you know um so i want to say it's intuition man i just like i'm i'm here and i, I want to be a part of it and um, I want to celebrate every little moment that happens and, and be true to the, the storytelling of it all, you know? Um, I've also seen, <laughs> you know, in moments like when I'm involved with communities, you also understand like human relationships are, can be quite fleeting. They can be very disruptive, you know? You, I had an opportunity of documenting two lovers um, within this punk scene. And I realized within moments of meeting them that, there was no stability in this relationship, but look how fucking beautiful it looks to see two young black punk rockers in love, you know? Um, so yeah, it's just, it's really all about making sure everybody feels like, oh, they could look back and go, damn, I was there. And thank, thank you to, you know, Mookie's contribution to um, 
documenting my involvement in, in this in this moment in time. Thank you. I think I think it's that part there that I think comes across. It's your presence and your grounding in that community as well that I think it comes across in the work. And I think that's where, you know, some of the other comments that we heard, I, I think really resonate. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much for, for sharing your work. No, thank you. Thanks for taking the time. And thanks for bringing your family with too. Um, yeah, man. Say hi to the gang for me. Yeah, they all say hi. <laughs> yeah. Do we, uh, did we have anyone else, Claudia? I'm yeah, if anyone who doesn't have their camera on wants to ask <clears throat> or say hello, I do, or Craig. I, have just, I Craig, have a question. I know Courtney um, also wants to dive back in. I can see it, Courtney. And no? I'm back back to just the sort of the nuts and, nuts and bolts of your practice. When you talked earlier about working uh, in film and digital, and when you're in these contexts where you either get the image in the moment it's happening or not, because you're not, shaping these compositions do you find that um you approach the people you're working with differently when you're shooting digital versus film knowing that you have a finite uh number of uh exposures on a roll of film versus digital mm. um funny enough i actually trust myself a lot more with film than i do with digital i think knowing that there like there is no immediate review or feedback with the uh, film makes it makes my mind a little bit more intentional about uh, the way that I'm shooting um, you know I use a lot of natural light too um, but I think once I start roaming the world of digital I want to rely on all the bells and whistles that uh, a lot of digital photographers rely on in order to uh it's not even i wouldn't say they are composing a picture but rather like creating a photo in post-production you know when you start to think about the color grade and um really zooming into a photo you're like oh it's not sharp you know and uh, being overly critical whereas with film i'm like this is this is the moment that you got and this is true to that moment and uh any imperfection that you are being overly critical of is really uh, there's there's probably more beauty in it than I'm allowing my my mind's eye to uh, to see immediately. Um, so uh, yeah, I think in short, I, uh, I I just trust myself a hell of a lot more with film and with digital. I um, I hate the practice of it, and I hate the um, immediate feedback, and I hate how I overthink with uh, digital medium. Are you still looking at that camera that you hate so much? Oh yeah, I uh, <laughs> I had the talk with uh, Musha and uh, Claudia last week and I was just telling them that I had to buy a new digital camera for commercial work purposes, but um, it's, I think it's been in like use probably twice. Um, and uh, yesterday I went to go shoot some street photos um, and with the exponential rising costs of film and developing, I uh, still went to my film camera <laughs> instead of using this digital camera. So, yeah, uh, deep love for film. Uh, it's making me broke, but I, <laughs> I absolutely love it. Yeah. I'm just going to ask if Janice wants to say anything. And then um, I know we usually keep these to an hour. We're just over eight. So. We can wrap if you're uh, going to remain hidden and silent, Janice Reed. Oh, if I can. Hello, everyone. Artist. Um, I just the artist. Why are you hiding? Come on now. <laughs> Craig, I just like, can't turn her head all around. Time. She can't turn I'm her sorry. camera around, so she'll just say I'm hi. I'm sorry. It's all right. I'm it's sorry. Okay. Just wanted to say hello. And um, my name is Janice Reed. I'm a portrait fashion photographer. Um, I've shown my work at band um, and um, I also um, have my prints sold with band and photo. Um, I just wanted to say, um, I did enjoy how you described yourself, not only as a photographer, but also as an anthropologist, um, because um, I guess photography, in my opinion, photography is way more than just being a photographer. Uh, you're being an observer, uh, you're pointing out things that you want to highlight. So it 
gives you a little bit more elbow room to experiment and have that stance on it when you describe yourself that way. And I really enjoyed hearing that because um, I kind of see myself just a little bit more as a photographer. Um, yeah. And I also wanted to pinpoint that I enjoyed um, you saying that the importance of, I guess, Black imagery being made by Black people. Um, I think that sometimes it boils down to, and you mentioned also to aesthetic and trying to push and sell something. And we all, I think you can easily fall into that trap as an image maker. Um, mm. So I just also want to just say like, yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I, I really um, enjoyed hearing you pinpoint that as something that you avoid with your, your practice or that feeling of um, calling your, you know, your sitter a subject, you want to build a relationship and that is not a transactional thing that it, it's meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jonas. I think also um, to be a practicing photographer is very difficult in this day and age where, you know, ultimately you do need to do a lot of commercial work to, um, to be able to uh, pursue on these uh, personal projects. Um, and a lot of the time we are put into spaces that compromise, uh, well, we find ourselves making a compromise of our artistic voices or um, having to almost shelf your, your, your moral compass, um, uh, especially with the commodification of everything and advertising being so uh, uh, prominent in this world. Um, but uh, being able to, um, you know, own my voice as an artist and as a, yeah, visual anthropologist and and be a part of community and also stress the importance of representation, you know, um, it helps me center myself and, uh, yeah, just feel uh, an alignment within myself as a um, an artist in this world. Um, so, yeah, I, I understand the difficulties of... Um, you know, or the challenges of uh, working in the commercial field as well as uh, wanting to be a practicing artist. Um, yeah, one, uh, one, you know, keeps the lights on, the other keeps you up all night. Um, but yeah, uh, I think it's very important for us to remember the, the importance of representation and also um, staying true to who you are as, as an artist. That was beautiful. I... Last, thanks, Janice. Uh, thanks for the commentary and uh, for reminding us of the that comment. I like you. It resonated with me. It was um, that and your reference to Drum Magazine because we showed um, uh, James Barner early on in our relationship with the Contact Photography Festival, which goes back to 2014, which is an interesting year uh, for us both. Um, and it. Uh, it was interesting hearing you reference drum, knowing that James Barner, who's now in his 90s, shot for drum. So mm. came of age shooting for Drum Magazine uh, and working both in the UK and on the continent. You probably know James's work as and his studio in Accra. Um, oh, yeah. So that was what was, it was like watching a next generation of uh, young artists, practitioners making work who whose parents would have been sharing those same images which is, mm. uh, was amazing to hear. Um, we, uh, uh, in wrapping up, I'm gonna do a couple of things. One, uh, thank everybody for taking the time uh, to be here to uh, meet uh, you, Karabo. Thank Musha for her uh, work with uh, curating the show and for uh, leading us off in the discussion. And uh, Claudia, Natalie, uh, Fieri, the team at BAND for their behind the scenes work. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, board member Erica Russell, who I think had to jump off, who was here. I just want to acknowledge her for being our lead. She was, she leads the programming committee that basically was one of the first people to review your work um, when it came through uh, the online portal. And I mentioned that to say, we always say to people, please send work in. I don't think everyone checks their online portal, but we do. And you're a testament to that because you yeah. sent this stuff in. We took a look at it, followed up with you and the show happened. And we regret because of you know re, um, uh, back backlog with visas at the federal level mm -hmm. as well as the strike that we weren't able to have you come but we will host you uh, at some point I'm sure 
um, in the coming year or so. Uh, looking forward to seeing you in person and, and having you uh, meet folks in the city. Um, just want to quickly also say that the, there is a selection of uh, Krabbel's prints that's for sale. So if you're interested in uh, purchasing, let us know. The show is coming to an end soon, Josephine Dennis. So I'm not sure if you'll get here before it's uh, done from Montreal, but I hope you can see it. Um, and I will uh, also thank our sponsor, Scotiabank, for their support in making us um, uh, po making it possible for us to do this exhibition. Uh, and also uh, the Scotiabank Contact Photography Festival for including us always as one of their major exhibitions. I don't think I'm forgetting anyone, but if I am, I'm sure Claudia will tell me. Thank you all for taking yep. the time. Parabo, till Thank we you. meet in person, my friend. It's Thank been you very pleasure. much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to band, all the sponsors, the band that I documented, the community that I documented. Um, and thank you to everybody that was able to spend some time today. I really appreciate it. All right. Take care. All. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.